Judy, it's the middle of February. We just had another snowstorm here, and we're talking about swimming pools. What's the event about today? We are raising money to be able to provide swimming lessons to children at the Reiki School. Uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but when the Reiki School was built, it also incorporated a community center. And along with that, they have a wonderful pool facility. Um, so the children are provided swimming lessons, but they are not free. So we do provide funding for two grades of school children to get swimming lessons. Is that pool available to anyone in the community or just, or just students in the school? The pool is available to anyone in the community for a very nominal fee. I think they charge one to two dollars for Portland City residents. And what are you doing here today? So we're holding a silent auction. Um, we have various items that have been donated generously through different businesses and individuals in the community. And we're just going to have a good time here. We've got some snacks and some drinks and we're going to try to raise money. And who are the speakers here today? Uh, we have Joe Gray, who is a former city manager, Nick Mavadonis, who is city councilor and former mayor. We also have Paul Stevens and his family talking about experiences they've had at Reiki Pool, and Holly Seeliger, who's been on the school board. Hey, the swimming program at Reiki is the only activity that WENA supports financially. The other neighborhood efforts we're involved with require volunteers' time and elbow grease but this is the only one for which we regularly raise funds and solicit donations. Our goal is to raise $6,000 by the end of February to fund the programs for two years. I am often amazed to hear people say that they never realized that Reiki is a community center as well as a school. I'm doubly amazed when someone says, I never knew there was a pool at Reiki. I have to say that this bothers me, and I really wish that the community center side of Reiki were much more intensively used by more people of all ages, all day and evening, and all year round. We in the West End are especially fortunate to have a combined community center and school complete with a teaching pool, to live on a peninsula and not ensure that every student leaving Reiki has had an adequate opportunity to learn to swim ought to strike anyone as misguided and irresponsible. Through your generosity, we hope to make sure that all Reiki students have that chance and will continue to work to ensure that the City of Portland's assets and facilities located in the West End are used and enjoyed to their highest advantage by all age groups in the community. I also want to recognize our corporate sponsors, J.B. Brown & Sons, Sprague Operating Resources, Advanced Pierre Barber Foods, the Western Portland Harborview Hotel, and Graphic Wear. Also, Harmon and Barton's uh, florist provided the lovely flower arrangements. And I also want to tell the winner board how much I appreciate them for putting up with my craziness and countdowns, and thank them for a job well done. Judy Weatherall and Clifford Tremblay, raise your hands. They um, are the co-chairs of the silent auction, so if you have any questions about any of this bidding process and so on, they're the people to talk with. Ian Jacob yeah. hey, is the event coordinator. He coordinated all this, um, the lovely flowers and the whole setup here with the Weston. Mitch Mason, where is Mitch? There he is. Hey, he, along with Dick Stevens and Bjorn Swenson, uh, brought us into the age of PayPal that you could buy tickets online. And then we also have Penny Stevens, who's back at the will call table, Liz Parsons, and Jen DePhillip, who helped set things up here today. But they're also in charge of a second event that we're having on Wednesday, which is February 19th, and that's actually at the Reiki Pool. For those of you who got left behind during February school vacation and didn't make it to Disney World or the Caribbean, you can come that night to the Reiki Riviera. For $5, bring your bathing suit and your flip-flops and uh, have a good time. You can play some games, we'll have the pool be open, you can swim, and so on. Uh, we also have Christine McHale, who is Vice President. I don't see her here. And then also on the board are Lena Good Simpson and Tom McMillan, who could not be here today. Hey, lastly, I want to thank Bruce Wennerstrom, the manager of the Weston. Back in November, when we started planning this event, we had hoped to have it on Valentine's Day, but Bruce said no. Little did I know that Bruce is the Weston's own Punxsutawney Phil. 
And I really appreciate the weather that he arranged for us for today rather than Valentine's Day. Okay. Thank you for coming and for your generosity and engagement in the neighborhood. Now I hope that you'll enjoy yourselves at one of the per first public events at the fabulously re renovated and re-energized Eastland Hotel. We have some speakers. We're going to start with sort of a little historic review of Reiki with Joe Gray, who is the former city manager, who at um, well, the late 60s, early 1970s, was in the planning department and helped to actually plan Reiki. Okay, so we'll turn this over to Joe. Thank you, Roseanne, um, for giving me the opportunity to share with all of you my involvement with the planning and the construction of the Reiki School and with its various community features, including the, uh, the pool. I want to start by uh, taking you down memory lane and talk about two important local decisions that were made in the late 1960s and the early 1970s when I was first moving to Portland and working for the city and the then Portland Renewal Authority. These two decisions were largely focused on the West End and resulted in the building of the Reiki School. The first was Portland's decision to be involved in the Model Cities program, a President Lyndon Johnson's Great Society effort to rebuild older city neighborhoods with the focus on citizen participation in developing the plans and programs for the neighborhood. Portland designated the West End, the Western Prom, Bayside, and Parkside as its model neighborhood, but the center of real action was in the West End. Citizen committees were formed, and I know there were some people who are here today who can remember those committees. They worked late into the night developing plans for new social service, health, recreation programs, and creating neighborhood-based community organizations such as the Portland West Neighborhood Planning Council, which is now Learning Works. And um, I'm really taking you down memory lane when I mentioned LIP, which was the low-income people, which was a housing advocacy group uh, in the West End. There were programs which offered publicly financed loans and grants to rehab homes and apartments, something that had never been done before by the city. And also the city was actually helping to fund con and construct new housing, which resulted in the building of Danforth Heights and the infill housing at Dermot Court. The committee also identified educational needs of the neighborhood, including the possibility of a new school because at that point when they were doing the planning no one really knew whether or not one was going to be built but they all understood that um, a new school would be an essential part of the overall plan for the success of the model cities program the second pivotal community decision was taking place as this model cities effort was moving forward that event was the decision by the school committee and the city council to close three West End elementary schools, McClellan, Butler, and Rosa True, and also a fourth that was not considered part of the West End, the Shaler School on Center Street, and to consolidate all the students in one building to be built in the West End. These schools dated back to the 1800s. They lacked many educational amenities, <clears throat> had little or no library space, few common areas, and very limited, if any, outdoor play area. In addition to closing three public schools, the Catholic Diocese decided to close the Sacred Heart uh, Elementary School in the Parkside neighborhood. So the entire West End neighborhood was to see four schools close at the same time. You can well imagine the intense community debate which preceded and followed the decision of, of these, uh, to close these schools. Today, it's, uh, it's, it's hard enough to get a consensus just to change a school line district line, let alone close one school. Smaller, more intimate schools with a long history educating West End children were to, re were to be replaced with a large state-of-the-art for the 1970s community school. Equally important in that discussion was where to build a school because there was no vacant site that could accommodate the expected size of the school and the community features that the model cities plan and that the neighborhood envisioned and that the neighborhood was promised. Finally, the decision was made to locate Reiki between Brackett, Clark, and Spring Streets. To build meant the acquisition of three blocks of housing and some neighborhood stores. 
Some of you may remember the Malconian Market, which was a longtime family-owned and operated store which was located at the corner of Spring and Brackett Streets, an example of one of the businesses that, was acquired, that were acquired. This was the hard part of the decision, because to create the site for the school, about 100 families and individuals had to move, many who had owned their homes for years and had long ties to the neighborhood. All the buildings were going to have to be demolished, and the site cleared for the construction of the school. At first, it was a willing buyer uh, and willing seller, the property owner selling and the city buying. But later, in order to complete the site, the renewal authority on behalf of the city had to use eminent domain um, and actually, uh, unfortunately, um, force people to leave their property. Despite the intense community debate on the closing of so many schools and whether or not the proposed site was the right one and the relocation of so many families and individuals, the city council, by a five to four vote, made the difficult decision to move ahead using urban renewal funds to create the Reiki site. Once the decision was made, though, the community focus shifted to the design of the, cr of the critical features and pieces that would make up the new school. The open classroom learning environment concept so much in vogue in the 1970s was embraced. It was decided that the school should be able to accommodate up to 700 children and include a community health station, a library branch, space for adult education classes, a media center, a gym and recreation programming, and extensive outdoor play space. An interesting design feature was the crossover outdoor ramp, which you are all can associate which, uh, with the school. It was designed to be located where one of the former streets that used to intersect the, the blocks where the school is was located. Um, and also is certainly the recognition of the, of the community pool. Finally, as reported in the then uh, Portland Evening Express newspaper, on a late November day in 1973, the students from the former schools walked to the newly constructed $2.7 million Reiki school with their books and personal belongings in shopping bags. And that's a picture from the then Evening Express of the kids from each of the schools walking uh, and meeting each other at the new Riking uh, School. It's a, I think it's a great picture, uh, all carrying their shopping bags. Um, it should be noted that from the early meetings, there was always strong interest to include a community pool in the school. While the city operated the Kiwanis Pool as a seasonal pool on Douglas Street, the only other available pools were at the YM and the YWCA. Yes, there were community features to the school. I mentioned the library and the health station, but the committee involved in the school design felt including a pool available to all residents of the neighborhood and city made Reiki truly a community facility. An interesting side fact is that the pool was dedicated to Harold Hap Frank, who was a longtime YMCA executive and a former city council chairman. They didn't have mayors at that time, they called them chairman as a gesture of appreciation for his interest in recreational opportunities for Portland's youth. The success of the Reiki pool was very influential in later decisions to incorporate a pool in the building of the Riverton School in the late 1970s. Over the years, there's been much discussion about the physical design of Reiki as a learning environment, which has resulted in uh, interior modification of the school space but there has always been broad support for its various community features, notably the pool which continues to this day. I'm pleased that early in my Portland career I had the opportunity to play a role in helping to create the Reiki School site and later as city manager helping fund many of its community programs. And I want to thank you for letting me share some of these memories with you all today. Thank you. But right now we have another speaker for you who is going to talk about the importance of learning to swim. Okay, and I'm happy to introduce to you Councillor Nick Mavadonis, who was on the school board, not when Reiki was built, right, Nick? Uh, <laughs> but um, I'll turn this over to Nick. And one thing I do want to let you know about is we are, this is all being filmed by CTN, um, community television, you see the bright lights over there. So every time you walk up to get a drink, 
you're being captured on film, okay? And, and we'll count those trips at the end, okay? But seriously, you do, um, Wena is a member of CTN, and this will be on their web archives afterwards. If you look for Wena, you can see this event, and you also can see the film from Phil Thompson Day that we did at the State Street Church last spring. So right now, I'll turn this over to Nick. Uh, thank you, Roseanne. I have to say I'm not quite as prepared as Joe Gray was when he came up here with his uh, folder and, and uh, his printed materials. Um, but it is a ni very nice pleasure to be here. I appreciate uh, the invitation. Uh, when you called, I wondered why you wanted me to come. Um, but I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Um, I, first of all, I want to commend all of you for your efforts at uh, raising funds so that Reiki School students um, can learn to swim and summer programs for kids who live in the West End. Um, as an elected official, uh, it's very difficult at times for uh, school boards and city council to continue to fund things that they've always uh, funded. And, uh, you know, I've been through on the, on the city council. We, Joe talked about the Kiwanis Pool. There have been many efforts at not efforts, but there have been many times uh, there have been proposals to close that, and again, that's only open in the summer. Um, but those are things that municipalities do. We had a thing a few years ago re regarding swimming with the therapeutic swimming uh, program um, that, believe me, none of us knew how important a program that was uh, for the uh, participants in that until there was a discussion about, about closing that program. Um, so, uh, as an elected official, uh, the efforts that all of you actually, uh, things like this where people raise money and are able to continue to fund programs that are very important in the community um, really need to be commended. Um, as Roseanne said, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, uh, what do I say on the uh, importance of learning to swim on your program. <laughs> and uh, I've spent a lot of my life, actually all of my life around the water. Um, I didn't grow up in Portland, but my family uh, had a summer home on Great Diamond Island, and I learned to swim there. Our, our house was probably 200 feet from the beach, so uh, we were always in the water. My kids were always in the water um, when they were growing up. However, they learned to swim, I think it was at the YW before it was torn down, um, and they swam on the island like all island kids do, and there are some very elite island, uh, island uh, kids or kids who were grown up here who um, have jumped off docks and, and uh, spent time on beaches, and, and that's what kids do in the island. I, I, this really doesn't have a lot to do with learning to swim, but I, I have to tell you one. Um, I have two sons who were, who were born on the same day but two years apart, so every summer we had a big bash on Great Diamond, and, and all their friends from town would come and relatives and spend the night, and the kids would all want to jump off the dock. So some would swim on the beach and kayak and, and uh, want to swim on, on the dock. So we were down there with a bunch of 10 and 12 year olds, they're two years apart, and I was trying to be the chaperone. And the ferry came in, and I know the ferry well, I was a ferry captain at the time, and, and uh, I told, gave all the kids the rules. I said, you step back, you don't get near the, the edge of the dock when the, um, when the ferry comes in, uh, there's a propeller turning, you gotta be really careful. So anyway, the ferry came in, people unloaded, the captain started to take the line, or the crew took the line in, and the captain started to back up. And one of the kids, who's a good swimmer, but decided he was going to jump in the water before the ferry left. And he jumps off the end of the dock. The boat starts backing towards him. I'm yelling, stop the boat, stop the engines. Uh, fortunately, the captain saw it and, and uh, stopped the boat. But he swam around the dock, not paying any attention at all to the fact that there was a boat and propeller turning probably within 20 feet from him, and climbed up the ladder and acted like, what was wrong? But he was a good swimmer. Um, I'm not sure he could have uh, done battle with a propeller, but, but he was a good swimmer. Um, so just to say a little bit about, uh, uh, I've spent a lot of time working on the water, a lot of time working on Portland's waterfront. Um, swimming is, learning to swim is important. It's, as you all know, and some of you are, are very good swimmers, know that swimming is something that's great for exercise. It's something that I'm not telling you anything you don't know. It's a lifelong thing. It's like you can play golf or tennis and swim. Um, I can't play basketball anymore. Um, I got too old. But people can still swim at any age. Um, so it's very important. Um, I work on the water. Um, people who work on boats need to know how to swim. I can tell you there are fishermen who don't know how to swim. 
Um, there are some I know who wish they had learned how to swim. Um, we have people uh, who live in our community who aren't quite as fortunate as others, who uh, often live on the streets. Some of them spend an awful lot of time on the waterfront. We've had incidents, uh, not in the last few years, but we have had incidents in the recent uh, uh, t probably five or six years where people have actually fallen in the water and haven't been able to swim and, and have perished because of it. Um, so as, as was mentioned, um, we live in a city and we're on a peninsula. I live over by Back Cove. I can look out uh, from my house uh, down the street and see the water. We have water around us. Uh, it's very important that people know how to swim. It's a safety issue for people who, who spend time on boats and spend time on beaches and spend time on, on wharves around Portland. So it's a very important thing. I must tell you, though, um, I'm kind of an average swimmer. Um, I'll swim on a beach. You won't find me on a diving board. I don't mind saying that. Um, but I can swim. And like I said, I learned to swim out on one of the islands in Casco Bay. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty important thing. Um, I did jot down a couple of notes, and I'm trying to make sure that I, that I covered those things. Um, I, I do want to mention one thing that I, that I haven't, and I know you are raising money so that these programs can be put on, but as a city councilor, um, I can't help but mention the city's rec program and the staff that, that work uh, in our rec program uh, in our two schools, community schools. Um, so I want to just mention them um, and how por important those programs are. I will say, as Joe was talking about the history of, uh, of Reiki and the community center, community school uh, being built, um, I have had some experience in closing schools or recommending closing schools and uh, being on a building committee for the East End School. I've been on other building committees as well. But we're very fortunate that we have the community school at Reiki and also out at Riverton with pools. Um, when we looked at building a new uh, Jack, the new East End School, um, we looked at trying to make it as much of a community school as those two are. They were very good models. Um, but when you look at the infrastructure costs and you look at the maintenance costs of trying to have a pool in more than those two schools, it was, wasn't something that we could financially withstand. So it's really important that our elected officials um, do what they can to make sure there's funding to maintain our schools, to maintain Reiki, and we really can't do all of that without the efforts of all of you raising money um, for these programs so kids can learn to swim, and, uh, and not just kids who go to Reiki, but kids, kids who uh, may not go to Reiki but also live on the western part of the peninsula. So um, with that, I want to say thank you to all of you. Thanks, for Roseanne, for uh, inviting me. Um, and remember how important it is uh, for those who live in Portland, who work on the waterfront, who spend time on the bay, who spend time on the islands, that they learn how to swim. And the best way to do that is to learn it at a young age. So thank you very much. Okay, we have another speaker. This time our speaker is Holly Seeliger. She is the District 2 representative on the Portland School Board. Grew up in Maine and is going to talk about learning to swim as a kid in Maine. Thanks a lot, Roseanne. Glad I was asked to uh, be a part of this. Um, thank you everyone for all your hard work. This is a really classy event. Um, someone asked me if I'm a member of WENA and I am, although I need to pay my $5 membership fee. I was just remember that, so I need to pay my fee. So someone let me know and I will um, give the $5 membership fee to WENA. Um, really excited that my West End, I'm part on the district representative for West End, Parkside, and a little bit of Libby Town. And we have a public um, pool for people to use. Um, childhood, like uh, Nick said, childhood is the best time to learn how to swim. And it's a skill that can save your life or save someone else's life. And wouldn't it be amazing if every child in Maine could learn how to swim? And judging by all the drawings up here, as long as they stay up on the wall, um, the kids really appreciate um, being able to swim and being able to take the lessons. 
Um, just a few facts about kids in Maine. Child poverty uh, is on the rise in Maine since 2008. According to the Maine Children's Alliance, nearly 20% of children under 18 uh, live in poverty in Maine. And in Portland, child poverty is over 25%. So kids need activities to stay warm and active through the winter months. And when a swimming program at the Reiki School ensures access to activities, and it's an invaluable skill to learn how to swim. Like Roseanne said, I grew up in Maine. I didn't grow up in Portland. But I learned how to swim at about five years old. I started taking swimming lessons. And I really loved swimming. And I wanted to join the swim team until I watched the Jaws Marathon with my dad on TV. And I think it's in the third movie. Um, somehow the shark ends up in the local community pool. And it's, it was really scary to see as a kid. So um, I've still been pretty scared about a shark ending up in the pool. Um, not anymore, but there were a few years where I did not want to swim because of that. So um, I'm keeping my speech very brief. But please help kids um, learn how to swim. And uh, don't let kids watch the Jaws movie marathon. And they will enjoy the Reiki swimming pool very much. Thank you, Roseanne. But right now, we'd like to introduce the Stevens family. And this is a family from the West End who has had the total Reiki swimming experience of, what, three generations now? Not quite. On the way. Well, I, I guess we're presiding over the kind of closeout and cleanup here. Uh, this is my grandson, Stratton who has told me that he's not prepared to speak tonight, even though he's the youngest swimmer uh, in the family. But, <laughs> who did you say that's not true? <laughs> oh, that's true. And he's not here. So that's the youngest swimmer in the family. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> we have two young swimmers. What's that? What's that? That's a microphone. Okay. And this is son John, father of Stratton. And this is son Nate over here. So I have voluminous prepared remarks here, so I'm less prepared than Joe and more prepared than Nick, I think. <laughs> but um, both, of, both of our kids uh, grew up at Reiki, uh, and although they didn't learn to swim there, they learned to swim at the, at the YW, uh, but before they were old enough to go to Reiki, uh, they both swam at Reiki for a long time, from the time they were in kindergarten until the time that they graduated uh, from high school. And that, that swimming was both as, both as students at the school uh, and also as members of the Portland Porpoise, um, Portland Porpoise Swim Club. Uh, and Sharon Power, who was the uh, coach of the Portland Porpoise Swim Club for a good number of years, uh, mailed me some recollections of, of coaching at that pool, which was a little bit challenging uh, to coach competitive swimming uh, in that pool because I think that when the pool was designed, I don't think they thought uh, that they were going to get an Olympic gold medalist uh, out of that pool, which they did uh, with, Ian, with Ian Crocker. But some of Sharon's remarks were that at that time, and I haven't been in there recently, there were no lines on the bottom of the pool. And so the little kids who trained there, when they went to a swim meet, could see the lines on the bottom of the pool, and they were all wiggly because of the waves and the water, and they thought they were snakes, and they wouldn't go in the water uh, at the swim meet. <laughs> the, other, uh, the other problem was, uh, that uh, those of you who have swum uh, in competitive pools know was a T at the end of the pool where you're supposed to start initiate your flip turn and there were none of those at the uh, at the Reiki pool and so Sharon used to put hockey pucks on the bottom of the pool so that she could teach the kids to do flip turns in the pool uh, the other problem with the pool was and still is that it was too shallow to dive into so that she couldn't teach starts at the pool so those were all of the challenges the the pool is fairly narrow, so the lines were very close together. Uh, and I can remember Nate uh, and Ian uh, Crocker swimming there, uh, and they would use the lines to pull themselves along when they were doing the butterfly, or at least that's what their coach, <laughs> that's what their coach uh, says. Uh, the other thing that was nice about that pool was that, uh, and particularly in this kind of weather, is that you can step right outside and make snowballs. And so she remembers in this kind of weather when kids were standing shivering not wanting to get into the pool at 5:30 in the morning she would bring snowballs in with her and throw snowballs at the kids until they went until they went in the water uh, but despite all those problems uh, that pool produ produced an Olympic gold medalist with uh, Ian Crocker 
uh, produced uh, two Olympic qu trials qualifiers, my son Nate and, and Ian Crocker, uh, uh, five uh, junior national qualifiers who are Ian and Nate, uh, my son John, Angie Chessy, and, and Lindsay Hoffner. So uh, as Sharon said, no matter what pool they went to compete in, uh, it was always easier to swim in than the Reiki pool. Uh, but I think at this point I'm going to turn it over to John and Nate to say a little bit about their experience swimming there for probably close to 15 years, I think. <laughs> So yeah, I was there for the better part of 15 years, and I think despite the, um, the challenges of no lines on the bottom of the pool, and I think Nate can attest to doing flip turns and getting ankles stuck in the gutters that were there at the end of the pool, I uh, did a little quick calculation, and I think I figured I swam about 3,500 hours in that pool and close to 10 million yards um, over the course of swim lessons and say about four or five years there doing competitive swimming. So it definitely helped me out and you know set me on my way, sent me to Miami, which um, given the winter we were having, I kind of wish we were back there now. Um, and, you know, and Nate went off to college as well. But you know, at the end of the day, I could show up at any pool and you know that uh, it could definitely uh, be a little bit worse. Um, but I'm very much thankful for that pool. I, I, you know, a lot of good times there, a lot of uh, pleasant times spent. Um, and though, a difficult pool to swim in. It definitely serves its purpose as a great pool to learn to swim in, um, especially with the swim lessons that we had there at Reiki. So you can definitely be thankful that we had it, especially so close to the house when you have a 5 a.m. workout and getting out of bed at 4.50 to show up at 5 was pretty nice compared to some of our friends who uh, were living in Cumberland and having to drive in to swim there. But I think I'll turn it over to Nate now uh, and let him share a few things. Uh, hello, Nate Stevens. Um, so as John said and my, my dad noted, uh, pretty much grew up at Reiki with swim lessons and open swim and splash parties and later swimming for the porpoises and countless and many, many hours, early morning, late night, um, which took me on to, to college at the University of Arizona, um, which I'll tell a brief story of uh, when I arrived there as a freshman in the first couple days that I was there. And I was sitting down with a few of the guys you know, trying to get to know the team and all of these guys coming from all over the world, South Africa, London, France, um, Mexico, Venezuela, from very prestigious programs in the US. And one of them had known Ian um, from, I think, a national team. And he said to me, he said, uh, Nate, is it true you guys swam in like a really small pool? I said, well, yes, it is. And then I went on to describe Reiki as, you know, let's be honest, what it is, kind of a four lane cinder block warehouse. Um, and you know, and they just kind of all looked at me in disbelief um, that uh, a product like Ian or any of the other successful swimmers that came out of the pool um, could be successful uh, from swimming in such a small pool. And I think it just goes to show you that it really doesn't matter if you have 15 lanes and bleachers as long as you have water uh, in a pool for the community and a community to embrace that pool. So uh, I think it's wonderful that this is happening here today um, to support the swim lessons. Uh, and keep kids in the pool. Um, I have several, several friends that I grew up with that still to this age don't know how to swim. Um, and you know, having a, a family summer residence on Little Diamond Island, I can attest to the importance of swimming. So uh, thank you very much for having this uh, event today. Thanks. If people are interested in donating to this uh, to the we're swimming lessons but can't make it to the auction here today, where can they go for more information about doing that? So the West End Neighborhood Association has a website set up where you can make a donation through the, our PayPal account, and the website is wenamain.org.